Hey everybody, Mike here, and this week we're gonna do a bit of a different video to start out. Jill and I are still waiting on our new camera equipment to show up. Um, we got a Canon M50, thanks to the advice of Pete, Craigslist Hunter, so thank you, Pete. And a number of other things coming, like studio lighting and things that I just don't have anymore. Um, I had an old Nikon D3200, but honestly, it was such a pain to do videos with. And it took so much effort and it didn't have one of those screens that you can move and see yourself. So it really was a hassle. It was time to get rid of it. So today I'm gonna to do a sales video. We're gonna you know, work on the computer and I'll go through some stuff. And the, our first two weeks reselling, Joe and I did $1,755 between eBay and Etsy. Honestly, much better than I thought it would go for just getting back into reselling. I'm very happy with that. We have a total of 437 listings on eBay and a total of 228 listings on Etsy. Currently they're synced together through Cellbrite. I'm not sure if I like their program that much or not yet. I just given it a shot. I wanted something that can sync my inventory on eBay and Etsy if possible. And I may consider using a different option in the future. So I'm not gonna talk about that too much. But I would just want to go over 30 items today that we sold and explain why we picked them why we um, put them up for sale to begin with and how you can keep an eye out for this type of stuff. So first up is this motherboard. This was from a very old computer that I had. I mean, honestly, it must have been six, seven years old. Usually parts from those type of computers don't sell well. This one sold for $46. Um, I honestly don't know why this one sold for that amount of money. I don't know if it has much use at this point. Um, I believe it only has a slot for one graphics card. So it's not like you can use this for crypto mining or something that I'm aware of. If anyone has any information and knows why this model sold for this amount of money, however many years later, I would love to know, but I'm happy that we were able to get some money back because the computer um, just wasn't worth using whatsoever. Here we have some Italian handmade shoes. I found these at an estate sale. The brand is uh, Calzatura um, Varis. Now they're size 10 to 10 and a half, which is a nice common size. They were in very good condition. They looked really nice. I may have underpriced them. They sold for $45.95 within a couple hours. Um, it didn't seem like they had been worn or anything like that. So they really are a beautiful set of shoes. At estate sales, you can often find nice dress shoes, especially men's. So Keep an eye out for Italian made, handmade, custom looking shoes, nice leather. You can tell if the shoe is heavy and high quality. Um, I'm sure there's a number of brands you can keep an eye out for. I'm not that familiar with clothing, clothing brands, but anyone with just a general knowledge of clothing can tell if something is high quality or not. Now here we have the college um, vinyls. I had talked about these previously. There are a number of them we have um, ranging in years from early 70s to late 70s. These first few are from Ohio University. Each one sold for between 12 and $20. And they sold very quickly. Recently, we just sold this Ohio State vinyl brass roots for almost $50. So this one was sold for a lot more money than the previous ones. Now, video game manuals are not something I recommend people get into selling, and it's not because you're my competition. It's because you have to know what the hell you're looking for and what's worth money to make any money on them. Many video game manuals, as in 99.9% .9 are worth less than $10, maybe less than $5. I have a number of manuals that I saved over the years that I wanna go over here and just show you. So first up, we have Resident Evil 2. This is for PlayStation 1. This is considered a black label manual because it doesn't have the green streak on the left. High selling games in the PlayStation 1 era had the greatest hits editions, which then put the green streak on the left side of the case in the manual. The black label tends to be worth more. This was made in 98, very good condition. It sold very quickly. Here we have Monster Rancher. Again, a black label. I'm not sure if a green label even exists for Monster Rancher. It probably didn't sell that well. Um, it's in very nice condition. This game is pretty obscure and a lot of collectors need to finish it. 
So 20 bucks. Here we have Metal Gear Solid, the original black label again. This definitely had a green label version. Um, I accepted an offer for, I believe it was like $19 flat or something. For whatever reason, eBay's sales page doesn't actually show what you sold it for. So I might be a little off on some of these prices, but they're in the general range. Next up, we have Small Soldiers. This was a like, kind of obscure Game Boy game. Manual is in really good shape again. These type of things that I'm selling here are appealing to collectors. They must be in really nice condition. Otherwise, they're not very valuable. Again, almost 20 bucks. Now, these are not manuals that I found garage selling or picking. These are things I obtained over a number of years of selling video games from collectors and trading and things like that. They just happen to be sitting and I'm starting to list them now. I have a ton of collectors pieces like this and they aren't things you're gonna typically run into. Here we have a game I had never heard of, uh, Destrega. The manual is really in nice shape. There's very few for sale, 25 bucks within a couple days. And here's a big sale. This is the Black Label Silent Hill manual, really in nice shape. It had a little bit of wear in the bottom left corner you can see. I immediately got a ton of offers for it, but one guy really wanted it. He messaged me, asked me if I would take 55. I told him, you know what, I would. And so it sold for 55 within, I think the first week it was listed, but it had a lot of views. So it was getting a ton of traffic. I could have waited it out, but for me, I'm trying to move inventory right now and flip stuff. So I don't want it just sitting there. Here's something you can find at thrift stores, estate sales, garage sales, old cameras. Now, not old, all old cameras are worth money. You'll have to look up the model. There's a ton of brands, but what's important here is this camera was in really nice shape. It's a Minolta. It has the original manuals, which are hard to find. It's in really nice shape. It has the original um, band that, you know, you can hang it from your neck on. Everything is in good working order. And I put it up for 35, it sold very quickly to a guy in California who's clearly a collector because he sent me a message about making sure it was packaged really nicely. He wanted to display it. Um, people collect all sorts of camera equipment. So if you can find vintage cameras, you can look up their specific model. If they're in good shape, they're probably worth selling. If they're beat up, they're usually not worth selling unless it's super rare. So don't go buying a bunch of used cameras that look like crap. Here we have a Navy book. This came in our large lot of books, which our price paid per unit was around 20 cents. This is a really cool find. It's very tiny, by the way. It's like the size of the palm of an average hand. Every class in the Naval Academy gets a little handbook. This one is from the class of 66, 67. There were none on, uh, for sale on eBay of this year. Other years had sold for around 15 to 20 bucks. So I priced it at 21.95, ended up selling within two days, I think. Now this was a massive blunder on my part. I already talked about this in a separate video. This is the first Super Bowl um, magazine, you know, covering the game and the stats and all of that stuff. It's extremely rare. It's worth four to $600. It was in good shape. It had somewhere, but it was in good shape. And I listed it and it sold within seconds. So I knew there was something wrong. I didn't do proper research. I also made the mistake of listing it when I thought I had put it as a draft. But rather than cancel the order, I'll take the positive feedback. We still made a ton of profit. I paid 20 cents for it. A collector got the piece he wanted, which is cool with me. Um, but this is a mistake you don't wanna make. If you have something rare, something obscure, don't just go and list it. Make sure you have the price that it's supposed to sell for before you make the listing go live. A piece of advice someone put in the comments was if you have something you think is valuable, but you can't find the price, way overprice it. You know, put it up for $1,000 or something. Then if it sells, you're happy. And if it doesn't, you have time to adjust it and make the change. And that's good advice, but also there's a chance that maybe it's worth more than that. So I think the best move here is just don't list things if you don't know what they're worth. Here we have a sealed cassette tape. Now, cassette tapes aren't particularly valuable. There are some that are, 
but 99.999% of cassette tapes are flops. If they're sealed, maybe a little bit higher percentage aren't flops. But this to me seemed not very valuable. It's a dumb and dumber movie soundtrack cassette. I'm not sure what type of person would collect this. I guess maybe someone who collects movie related stuff. Um, I can't see someone who collects vintage cassettes collecting this. So I'm not sure, but it's sold fairly quick. I think I accepted the offer for 15 bucks. I wanted it gone just because I'm trying to get rid of all the cassettes that we have. They were given to us for free with the book lot. So I'm very happy with the sale, but it's an odd one for me. Um, if you have sealed cassettes, obviously take the time to look each one up because sometimes they're worth money. And if they're not, I just lot them together and auction them off or something. Here's a book I knew would sell for a lot of money. This is Contact by Carl Sagan um, or Sagan. I don't know how you actually say his last name. But Carl Sagan was a really famous scientist. He died a number of years ago. And he worked really hard to educate the public on um, scientific matters and combat things like anti-vaccination and anti-intellectualism. He really is a cool guy. And his books are worth a lot of money if they're in good condition. This book had not been used. It was crisp, clean, beautiful book. It ended up selling for 60 bucks. It took about a week and a half after listing it, I believe. But I knew it would sell for a lot. I told Jill right away, I go, this is going to sell for good money. It's just a beautiful book. And sure enough, 20 cents in the 61 right there. So if you find old science books that are written by notable names, if they're in good condition, you can usually get a fair amount of money for them. Here's a bit more of an obscure one. It's a fan guide to Charlie's Angel. It was made in 2006, so it's not particularly vintage. I mean, it's a little older. It sold for 20 bucks fast, like within a week. There were very few for sale anywhere. I couldn't find any sales history for it. It seemed like such an odd book for someone to buy, in my opinion, but 20 bucks. Um, I guess if you find these fan guides, you can look them up. I'm not sure if they're typically this valuable or if this is just because it's a popular name like Charlie's Angels. Next, we have another um, science book. This one's from 2012. Again, it was, I listed as a new condition. It hadn't been opened or messed with. It was really nice looking and $21.95. So books are really easy to look up with the Amazon app. You can scan the barcode or use the camera to scan the cover and it will show you the book. Now, this is a mistake I wanted to share with everyone, and it's a dumb mistake. It cost me money, um, almost 20 bucks with shipping and returning and all that. If you read, this says History of Ohio Law, two volume cloth set. I read that as second volume. So I listed only the second volume of the book under this rather than the two volume set. The person purchased it thinking they're getting two books. They only got one. So now they're pissed off. And um, it ended up causing me a return. I just refunded them right away. This is the type of mistake you don't want to make. Here's a really interesting and somewhat obscure book, Children of the Matrix, How an Interdimensional Race Has Controlled the World for Thousands of Years. When I first seen this book, I didn't know what the hell to think about it. We listed it at a competitive price on Amazon. It sold, I'm not even kidding, within two days. So sometimes the weirdest stuff sells. I don't know how to explain it, but there's people collecting all kinds of weird stuff. Maybe it's a gag gift. Maybe it's someone buying this for the conspiracy theory dad. Um, who knows? This is a cool one. This is the Nautilus handbook. Nautilus Fitness um, made all kinds of different workout equipment. And this was a brand new guide to some of that workout equipment from the 80s. This only took about a week to sell. We got 25 bucks for it. There was some other ones listed, but they were in worse condition. Old guides, if they're in good condition, usually will bring you a fair amount of money because they're not that prominent if they're in nice condition. Um, over the years, if you think about what people do with guides, they throw them in drawers and cubbies. They throw them out. They move and cram them all into a box. They don't tend to survive in good condition. People don't put them on their bookshelf like other books. 
So this is really a nice find and you can keep an eye out for all sorts of instructional books in good condition. Here we have two light switches. Now this is something you can find very prominently inside of thrift stores. We got a bag of three of them for a dollar. One of them was damaged, the other two I put up and they sold for $20 within a couple of days. We find all sorts of new old stock type items like this at our local thrift stores and they can be good pickups. It, they're easy to search, they have a model number. If they're still in their original packaging, I mean, really easy flips. Here's some vintage Pyrex we picked up from an uh, estate sale auction. We got a bunch of it for like 30 bucks, I think. Um, really nice pieces, some colored glass and patterned glass with the lids, which are rare. Now these ramekins I put up and they sold within a few hours. Um, the other listings were listed around the same exact price, but none of them had free shipping. So I decided to put free shipping, but raise the price higher and they sold really quickly. The thing about it was the shipping ended up not being very much for me at all, under $7 because someone close by bought them. Free shipping can be tricky. It can work in your favor or it can really hurt you. So you have to be um, methodical about when you decide to put free shipping on an item, short of it being a very small, tiny thing. Here we have this vintage tennis racket. We have about 12 vintage tennis rackets. We got them all for like a buck or two at the thrift store. This one had really nice woodwork. It'd be a great display piece. I put that, you know, display piece, man cave, sold within two weeks, 24 bucks. Now, a lot of people don't buy tennis rackets and big rackets like this because they're worried about shipping. The thing is they're designed to be very light. The shipping on this was like $7, I think. So it wasn't terrible at all. Um, overall, you know, we at least quadrupled our money after fees and stuff. I'll take that all day. Now, if you don't have room to store them, I understand that aspect, but they're really cool pieces. There's a few that are worth like upwards of $40 that we picked up for a couple of bucks. So um, if you find any type of display pieces, really nice woodwork on these old rackets, people love to hang them. They're really easy to mount. Here we have a vintage book. We found a bunch of, bunch of vintage books at um, an estate sale of a woman who was in her 90s. We found a 105 year old jungle book, um, very rare. Here we have something of value from 1955. I just looked up sold listings on eBay, priced it around that. I had a sale going on, it sold for 1996 within a week, I would say. Here we have the Canon sports glass. These are just miniature binoculars, but they were in their original box and they had their original case. These are from the same estate sale as the book I just showed you. We paid $1 for these, like $1 flat. Um, it took about a week to sell. I'm assuming they're going to some sort of collector again. People collect these type of brands from cameras and lenses. Canon's a very well-known brand. And um, this is a great pickup because shipping on this was like four bucks. Here we have a vintage Levi's belt. Now this is interesting because it's a very tiny size. This is a 30 to 32, real 30 to 32, right? This belt does not stretch. It's a hide belt. These older belts that are made out of leather don't stretch. So they're like true to size. Now, most men have a waist bigger than 30 to 32. Um, of course, there are a number of smaller guys, but in modern age, th these sizes are kind of dwindling in popularity because um, people are not this size anymore. Also, you know, older belts don't tend to stretch very well. So people buy stretchier belts. So when you sell something like this, you need to put the exact measurement. You need to explain that it's not gonna stretch and that you have to be that size. I think I accepted offer for 16 bucks. We paid like a dollar for it. The reason I accepted it is because I knew the size is not popular. So I would rather just get it sold, make the money and move on. But if you can find a vintage Levi's belt that's a much bigger size, it's going to be worth quite a bit of money because there's definitely people looking for them and they're not particularly easy to find, especially in good condition. Belts take a beating. So if you find nice belts, nice hide belts, Levi's belts, they're usually worth picking up. They're easy to look up. And um, 
oftentimes they might have some type of design or something that is a telltale way to look them up. For instance, this has the blue stripe, really simple to look up. This is something that I happen to know about because of crypto of all things. Um, you know, I'm very interested in cryptocurrencies and how they work and function and how to mine them and things like that. Well, when you mine crypto, part of any package is a PSU, which stands for power supply unit. These are also prominent in computing and networking and um, servers. When we seen this at the thrift store, I think it was $9.99, I knew it was a power supply unit for something. However, they had put a label that I could not get off over the model number. And I couldn't find anything about this brand, but I took a risk on it because I know power supply units are expensive. Now, if you see a nice like aluminum box, heavy power unit, they are typically gonna be worth between 50 and $150. These type of units are expensive and manufactured for a very specific purpose usually. In this case, it turned out to be a battery charger for a mobile wheelchair. I had no idea. All, only three were listed on eBay in the last year or so, I think something like that. And two of them had sold for 80 bucks. So I priced it at $80. Was in a week we sold it, so it was ten into eighty. I easily fit it into a flat rate bubble mailer, nice and wrapped, and we just got positive feedback today about fast shipping and it, everything's working great. So um, you can definitely keep an eye out for power supply units at thrift stores. They end up there from time to time, and you can tell the difference between like a normal power cable and something that is designed to really power something heavy duty. So that's 30 items we sold in our first two weeks back. I just wanted to share that with you. Um, you know, it's been an adventure and we've been listing and taking photos like crazy. Thanks, huge thanks to Jill for helping me. I mean, she works full time. I just started back at school, but she's been helping with photography a lot because my phone was having issues. And um, I just wanted to share that information with you, talk to you. And I hope you like this type of video. Let me know if you have feedback. Let me know if you have questions. Let me know if you have information about the stuff we showed. I am working towards posting on Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday every week. Again, we're still waiting on camera equipment. So it's not set in stone yet. But once we get our cameras, I'm really excited to start recording firsthand what we're doing and sharing a bunch of different stuff with everyone. So thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.